Welcome everyone to the Devonshire Street Cemetery Reinterment Records webinar as part of New South Wales History Week. My name is Cathy Dunn and I'm from Australian History Research, our website www.australianhistoryresearch.info. Today we're going to be looking at how to research the 1901 reinterment of the Devonshire Street Cemetery that was located at Sydney. Some 30,000 plus burials were exhumed and reinterred at Bungawong Cemetery out at La Perouse or Botany and other cemeteries as per requested by family members in 1801 and this was all done to make way for Central Railway Station. Prior to Devonshire Street Burial Ground, um, Cemetery, which was also, some of the records show it, it's called Sand Hill Cemetery. There was the Old Sydney Burial Ground from September 1792 to January 1820. And that today is the site of Sydney Town Hall. Prior to the September 1792, there were burials in three different locations around Sydney Cove. The bodies, the graves, the coffins were exhumed in a, in a trenching format. And the project actually employed quite a lot of people. And it was completed in 1901 for the start of the building of Central Railway Station. So with over 30,000 burials, today we're going to be looking at the, the availability of the records of who was exhumed and where were their remains and, and in some cases headstones, where were they taken to. The whole process was actually described in the newspaper as tearing pages out of our history book, but there are some pages best torn out. Although the tearing hurts us, goodbye, good night, forgotten dead of long ago. All the images we're showing here today are part of the Josephine Foster collection, which has been digitised and which is recently been digitised and is available online at the State Library and we will be looking at some of the other resources at the State Library too as well as the New South Wales State Archives. So you can see they just didn't dig a couple of feet below the ground. The whole area was completely gutted. Now with burials they do move under the ground and there have been some findings of remains in the Central Railway area. Recently, um, part of the new tramway um, tracks that are being done. And we're so fortunate to have a recorded history in images and photos. So next time you're at Central Railway Station, once we all come out of lockdown, when you actually walk out into Eddy Avenue and out to Belmore Park, that is where the Devonshire Street Cemetery was located. The work for this was planned at nearly about 15 years earlier. Even er There's even other early records that state, well, if we got rid of the cemetery, we would be able to put or increase our railway. The cemetery has had a Jewish section, a Church of England, a congregation, a Presbyterian section, Friends of Society section. So there were definitely different sections. The early section um, of the Church of England had a corner on the north side that was persistent specifically for Jewish people and it wasn't until later on where a space was allocated to the for Jewish burials. 
So we've got the Roman Catholic, the Presbyterian, the Congregation, there's, and as I said, there's also the Church of England and Jewish section. Josephine Foster spent every, every weekend taking photographs of all the headstones before they were removed to either La Perouse, Rookwood, as per requested by family members. If a family member did not request a removal of remains, they went to La Perouse. They even had to build a special railway track to take the remains out to La Perouse. Yes, it is the Quakers, Chloe, for that section. And yes, they their meeting room was actually located on the quite near the cemetery. And we've also got um, the caretaker's cottage that was on the, on the site too. So here's Josephine in 1901 taking photographs of all the headstones. Some of them are landscape views and others are photographs of the actual headstone. And of course, she did all this work with her husband, Arthur. And while she was taking the photographs, and look how she's standing. She's standing on an old table, um, balancing herself. And he, Arthur, actually transcribed all the headstones of all the sections. And they are also being digitised. So here's some of her photographs. And here are some of the inscriptions. And he did the Roman Catholic, the Jewish Presbyterian Congregation and Wesleyan. And they were compiled, they're digitized and they're compiled by Arthur Foster. And these are available online. Now, from a research point of view, or even a family history point of view, a transcription of a headstone is such a wonderful resource because it can not only give you the information on the person you may be looking at but many times you've got family members buried in a vault a tomb or in the same plot for that matter so you can get nearly three generations from one headstone with ages and other information that has been put on the headstone he, for example, is Francis Mitz, who died in 1828. So Devonshire Street Cemetery started, the first burial was in September 1818, 18, oh, sorry, 1819. They did not put a big red text mark through the burial register and said, okay, everyone below this line is now at Devonshire Street. There is a change over period and there's about eight, there is 81 burials in that changeover period. 30 of them have been proven by their headstone, by their death notice uh, or their funeral notice or reinterment record that they are at Devonshire Street. So there's still 50 that we don't know whether they're buried at Old Sydney Burial Ground or whether they are at the new cemetery being Devonshire Street Cemetery. And she's actually a first leader. And look, it's even on her headstone. She arrived in the colony on the ship on the, in, with the first fleet in the year 1788. And a lot of the first leaders actually, after they passed away, actually put that they, were, um, that they had arrived with the first fleet. So they were actually proud, all the people doing their headstones were proud that they were a first fleet. And yes, the work that Josephine, uh, Arthur and Josephine Foster did is, uh, is an, um, it is amazing e every weekend. And they had no personal connection with the cemetery, but it's something they just wanted to do because they felt that they we were losing our history. And of course, the journalists were there all the time, um, taking transcriptions, putting it in the newspaper because it was really topical at the time. And of course, newspapers copied each other, just like they do today. 
they copied each other all the time. So when you go into Trove and you're researching a burial and you're look, researching an, a reinterment of 1901, check the newspapers, but not just the Sydney newspapers, the Victorian papers, the Queensland papers, even Western Australian papers had articles about Devonshire Street, the removal of Devonshire Street burial ground. This is from the Redfern End. So there's a massive amount of photographs. The newspaper articles even give good stats. And there's a report here to say that there are at least 5,000 bodies which cannot be located. And they were finding remains under footpaths, as I said before, burials re do move under the ground. But what sort of stats are we looking at? Known burials, just over 13,000. But there's 16,000 who they do, do not know who they were. It was just a coffin. There was no remaining, there was no headstone. There was no um, coffin plate to give the identification to that person. So what they did was they actually bundled five sets of remains together. They will put in new coffins and then trammed out to La Perouse. So when you're looking for reinterment records, you've got a 50% chance of there may be a record of reinterment because they just did not know the exact names of the people. There was no identification. So they did know, the known ones are Church of England, 1,600, Roman Catholic, 1959, Presbyterian, just over 1,000, Wesleyan, 316, Congregational, 300, Jewish, 49. These are knowns and Society of Friends, three. Then the unknown burials, Church of England, over 4,000, Roman Catholic, over 8,000. We're talking massive of numbers here for the burials. Many of you may know of Keith Johnson and Malcolm Sainty's book, which is called Sydney Burial Ground, 1819 to 1901. And they have indexed the burial um, licenses to burial, the burial butts, and also included a previous publication, which was the 1979 um, transcriptions of the headstones. It's an out of print book, but it's definitely, if you ever see a copy, it's definitely a good book that won't be on your bookcase very long because it's always on my side desk. So, of course, burial records are a good source of information. They're not, prior to 1855, they are not death records. They are not a death certificate. They are burials. It is a record of the event of the burial. You're not always going to have when the person was born or where, who the parents are, when did they get married, when did they, what ship did they arrive on if they weren't born here, um, what was their cause of death, it's not how many children did they have, did they have two marriages, all that information is not on a burial record. In the case here, we've got the name Sarah Jane Err, her abode was Piemont, that doesn't mean she died at Piemont. We have her age is 25. We give her quality or profession and a husband's clerk. So it means that she was married and her husband was a clerk. When did she die and when was she buried? In the earlier ones, you're only going to get a burial date. You will not get a death date. So they must be they must be, when you're looking at these records, please take notice, there is a difference between a death date and a burial date. In the earlier records, Macquarie in 1811, 1812 said, look, 
I need more information about all these people who are dying. So what I want you to do is I want you when you do a burial registration is to put their ship no, their ship arrival on it. So from uh, 1811 plus right through to about 1830, the returns of the month monthly returns of the burials, sometimes they're quarterly, has the age of the person, but also has their status of arrival and their ship of arrival. It is still primary record, but always double check that status of arrival and the ship arrival. If it's a child, it doesn't always give the parents' names. Of the headstones that were taken from Devonshire Street Cemetery out to La Perouse, there are a total now today of the surviving headstones have been replaced into what's called Botany Pioneer Park. And it's an ocean of headstones. The artwork is amazing on some of the um, headstones. The genealogical information and also the history information is amazing too. And as I said, it is an ocean of headstones. These have all been subscribed, um, transcribed. So the headstones went out to La Perouse or Botany Cemetery and then later on they created what's called now called Bot Botany Pioneer Park. There were 282 2,825 headstones that were removed to Bunurong, La Perouse, Botany in 1901 from Devonshire Street Cemetery. But only 746 survived when they were moved once again to, still within La Perouse but, and the Botany Memorial Park, but for, but the headstones were moved to the Botany Piney Memorial Park in 1796. So if you have a headstone and remains that were taken from Devonshire Street out to La Perouse, they may not have survived yet another coal. The Capes Bank Family History Society is a bicentennial project in 1987 transcribed the surviving seven, um, 746 headstones at the Memorial Park. And they were also cross-referenced with the previous um, transcriptions that were done in 17, sorry, not 17, in 1969 and the early 1970s. They produced a booklet of 68 pages and in 2001, they went digital. And you can now actually buy that booklet on CD-ROM and it has a new title, Botany Cemetery, Transcriptions of Pioneer Memorial Park. But today we're, we're looking at the reinterment records. New South Wales State Archives provides a repository for government records and it does hold the records of the Devonshire Street Cemetery Board of 1801 and these include the interment records. Yes, you can search the index online. Now remember, it is only an index. It is not going to have all the details from the original record. The process of this whole reinterment and the moving of remains actually took nearly 12 months because the family had to fill out a form, the form had to be ticked, the grave or the headstone had to be found, that had to be ticked back off, the tramway had to be built from Central Railway or from Sydney out to La Perouse to take the remains out there. So the process did take over 12 months. So this is why when you're looking at the newspaper reports, just don't look no, by June 1901. Actually go back and you'll see the announcements in regards to um, the call out for people to say, 
come and claim your ancestors' land. And there was no cost to them. The Devonshire Street Cemetery Reinterment Register contains details of the remains and in some cases monuments from the cemetery following its resumption to for the development of Central Railway Station. The State Archives of New South Wales Index contains surname, first name, date of death if known, the cemetery where they were reinterned, the number or the page number and of course the citation. The original records, and as I said, it's only an index. The original records, or the original register, includes the, the number, all the headstones were given a number. Now, if you, and if you look at some of Josephine Foster's photos, you can actually see that the surveyors were drawing numbers um, on, on the individual headstones. So uh, there was a, a four-step process that had to be numbered, cross-referenced, the name of the deceased, the date of the death, if known, the cemetery where they were reinterned, and also the location. For example, at Rookwood, it will give you the division, the section, and also the number. The name and address of the person who actually requested the transfer, and any other remarks. These are not actually in the index, as I said before. It is an index. So let's go look at the index. And all these links we have put up on Australian History Research page on the Devonshire Street Cemetery page. So you can search the index. And we're actually going to search for, they're the original records. And as you can see, they're in family groups according to the headstone burials. So there's 900, oh sorry, 9,559 entries. Yet today there's only 700, 700 odd headstones survived. And that 9,000 is from over 13,000 known people who were removed. So the numbers aren't ma ma matching up. That is because of the family groups. So, and in some cases, there's more than one person to an entry, such as um, a, a family group. This is one of the relics out at Botany Piney Park, and it's Janet Havens, H-A-V-E-N-S. The State Archives New South Wales collection does not have a sound X. So when you put a name in and it's a nil result, try a different name variation. So we're going to do Haven, H-A-V-E-N-S. Yep, no records found. Okay, let's see if we can do something else. Haven, still no record found. So let's do, say, Janet. And here are the Janets. So we're looking for Janet Haven. We know there is a burial there because there are a tombstone relic out of Botany Pioneer Park. You cannot use the reinterment index here as a standalone. You have to have other information. We have to, you have to have other information, whether it be a death record, uh, sorry, a death record or a burial record, because after 1855 they're death records, whether a newspaper um, reference to a funeral or a death, and you have to remember there were other cemeteries you know, from the 1840s in the surrounding areas. And for those who weren't moved to Botany, um, everyone was moved to Botany. Unless a family member said, I would like my, my um, ancestors moved to Rookwood. 
So if no one claimed the remains or no one filled out a form or the bodies were not able to be identified, the rest went out to Botany, La Perouse, etc. Now, in this particular, in the State Archives records, it's referred to as La Perouse. But as you can see here for Janet, we've got Rookwood, Rookwood, Rookwood. So that automatically tells you that family members have requested that the remains be moved over to Rookwood. And then we've got La Perouse. But we're looking for Janet Haven. And I've only got three pages, so it shouldn't take too long. And guess what? She's not there. Simply means there's no record of the reinterment, but we do know that the headstone or tombstone is over. So I've searched by her surname, couldn't find her. Searched by her first name. And, and you've also got to be open to name, as I said, name variations. If in doubt, you can see that some of the dates of death are not complete. That's because the information was not even on their headstone. So if we go back and let's say we do 1855, which is when, and here we have the dates of deaths of from 1855. You can now it's only given me the date of death as an exact for 1855. So if your ancestor died on the 1st of March 1855, they're not going to be in these results because it's only giving 1855. And you're all going to say <clears throat> <coughs> something wrong. There's an 1864. It simply means it's something on this record refers to 1855. Janet Havens died on the 12th of March 1855 at South Sydney. She was buried on the 14th of March at Devonshire Street. She was from Scotland and she arrived in New South Wales aboard the Orient in 1839. So you're doing your family history. So let's look for a child. And in this particular case, it's an adult child. And I'm going to type in Elizabeth Campbell. I have one. And notice there's no date of death and there's no cemetery where in turn. So that automatically says to me, they went out to La Perouse. Some people did go up to Sandgate, but not many. The reason why I didn't get the result I was looking for is because I've spelt the name wrong. And it still has come up with no results. So we can type in William Smith and you think, oh gee, Kathy's crazy. Why William Smith? Okay. We can see someone moved out to South Gate, uh, South Head, Rookwood, La Perouse, and and Rookwood. If it is blank, it is actually La Perouse. They were able to identify the body, but no one had claimed. So if we go back to page one. You'll see it's got details here on the side. Now I'm actually looking for a William Smith in October 1850. And of course, there's no record for, the, for that William Smith. So I'm going to try Janet Smith now. I've got one. La Perouse, no date of death, but let's look at the details. Allow it to load. 
So here we have a Janet Smith, date of death, no record. So therefore on the headstone, there was no record. We also have a file number, where, what cemetery, and you can actually order this online. Click a copy and it will give you your ordering file number 791. And you and it's three dollars thirty, and you can add it to your cart. It's not giving much detail there, but that's as per record found. So let's go back to William Smith again. And Janet Smith was file number 791 but here we have a William Smith La Perouse also file 791 and it's because there's no date of death on their headstone and there's the information so if you order file if one ordered file 791 index number 89 you would actually get the the Smith's family all the details for their reinterment. No one requested their headstone um, and their remains to be moved out to Botany, but they were identified by their headstone in the coffin and they were therefore moved out to Botany or La Perouse. So you've got your number and your page. And you can see here on the third last column, it's got the name of the person, the address of the person who requested it. If no family member requested the internment and remains were able to be identified, the remains and possibly the, and the headstone, if a headstone is applicable, were all taken out to La Perouse. It is only if a member, a family member requested that they actually went out to to another location as requested. Majority did go out to La Perouse. Now with, so that's, those internment records are available on the state records or state archives of New South Wales. Now back to with, you, with any of your search, especially at the State Archives of New South Wales, two names are better than one. So, when you're searching for a name, always use, wherever possible, two names. Because if you type for Smith, you're going to get zillions of entries. There is no sound X and you can actually buy them and purchase them and they can be electronically or hard copy. But wait, there's COVID. So at the moment, the state archives, uh, sorry, yes, the state archives are closed. So they're not, go, they're not physically able to go and scan the pages and do all that for you. So just be aware, should you order anything online, like I'm, um, ordering, I want to order something off the Mitchell Library at the moment, but I have to just be patient and wait. So, if we go to If we go back, and I'm actually going to... Now, someone's asked about Jane Stack in 1816. 1816 is not going to be possible for Devonshire Street Cemetery because it did not start until 18, uh, 1819. So this is where you probably... If that person was from Sydney, the chances are they're at Old Sydney Burial Ground. Are these records for those cemeteries from where are they located? 
They're located at Sydney Interstate Archives out of Kingswood. But remember I said that Arthur and Josephine not only were taking photos, Arthur was actually transcribing the headstones. And at the State Library, there is his collection and they have been digitised. Now, this is the catalogue entry. He's transcribed all the headstones, even the headstones that have not survived. For Church of England, two books. For the Roman Catholic, Jewish and the Congregational. And they're available online. So we can go down the page. At the front there is an index to say what number they're on. So we'll just go to first file. And I'm going to view it to make it larger. There you go. Only happens when you're doing something live. So we'll just go back. Okay, the link is broken. So that's okay. We'll go back to the very beginning and we'll search from the catalog And here we have here, that is a microform or microfilm. And we have the manuscripts, the names of the deceased person transferred. That is only found in the library. What you need to do is to go over to the side and click access and click online. And here we have the online collection. There are Josephine's photographs, and here we have the Church of England. Oh, sorry, Roman Catholic. So the first few pages are, of course, an index, and they're giving the date of death, the, cemetery, the headstone number, but also the page number within the book. And you can see that it's also called the Sand Hills Cemetery. And these are the transcriptions of the tombstones of those sections, Roman Catholic, Jewish, Presbyterian, Congregation, etc. But I actually want the Church of England. There's a reason for it. And I do apologise for the broken link. So... That does say Roman Catholic. There's some glass negatives. So Josephine's collection has some glass negatives and the others are actual photographs and there's six volumes. Now here we go. Once again, not the section I'm looking for. So what you can do is you can actually go up the ladder and I want to go to this one here which is the one that had the broken link, but we'll see if it, we can get it to work again. Yes, it worked. Now, and what's because it's digital, you're able to increase the size. So here we have a transcription of the headstone, but you'll notice that Arthur... Foster also does the styling of the headstone. Sacred to the memory of Richard Webb, only son of Richard and Mary Webb of Goulburn Street, Sydney. Thank you, I've got, a, I've got a, a physical address. Who departed this life 31st of October, 1841, and his age, and also the stonemason who made the headstone. But if we have a look over here, removed to La Perouse. So you can actually look at Arthur Foster's transcription of the headstones and he also has placed what happened to the remains 
and the headstones. You can spend hours going through this because it's not necessarily in alphabetical order. So you have to go to the front of the book, check the index. There is a massive amount of family history information on all these pages. We can increase to make it larger. John Nobbs, Charles Bray, and he's put a description, 1840 headstone, and this one is a tomb. So you can see, and he's put the best he could with some of the transcriptions. And these people were removed to La Perouse. So there's another source of, there is another source there of um, interment records. Now, we have been asked, um, we have been asked, what about Edward Bliss Jolly of 1854? Time periods, right? So first thing I'm going to do is just do a surname search because it's not exactly a It's not exactly a good, it's not exactly a, a common name. Okay, we actually have here four jollies. Now, you'll notice on the file number on the side, we have 744, 744, 744. That to me tells me it's a family group in the one burial locate, in the one burial plot. And if we click it, we've got good dates of deaths. And we're looking for Jolly who died in 1854 on the 21st of March. Now, we've got the 22nd of March. That's okay. Edward Bliss, details. So we've got first name, surname, according to the headstone. He was and they went out to La Perouse and once again you can order it online which will give you the copy of the full index if you know what church, what religion they were buried in you can also go to Arthur Foster's collection and see if the headstone was transcribed. So we've got the Church of England, all, all the sections, and you can see the amount of work that has been done with this. And it's even got your road number. So this goes back to 1820, even though it was made in 18, in 1900 and 1901. And it's so often overlooked as a resource for researchers, but it's a primary record. So I, Josephine was taking photos Arthur was transcribing on the northern side so it gives all the details and it's row in the driver so this is a column because he's put the eastern western southern and also northern side of the headstone now there were some remains that were re-exhumed and re-interned into Devonshire Street from the old Sydney burial ground. They weren't all necessarily done in 1820. Some were still being, some re-interments were still happening in 1830 and also 1840. So there are some headstones that he would have transcribed which were from old Sydney burial ground pre-1820. And yes, um, Gooseberry Queen of the Sydney tribe. She was buried at Devonshire Street and there is a collection 
um, there is a photograph um, of her headstone and that is in the Foster collection. Now, someone's put the note, their ancestor died in 1851. Is it possible to find the transcribed headstone? Okay, we've got a birth year, a death year, sorry. Have a look at what possible religion they were buried at. If you do not know the religion, start a checklist. You're going to have to check the Church of England, the Jewish, the Congregational, the Presbyterian, etc. So before you start going all the way through Arthur Foster's transcriptions, you've got the name. See if there is a death notice or a burial notice for him in the Sydney papers because that will tell you what um, area he may have been, the person may have been buried in. And also, do you have a death certificate? Because your death certificate is, will show you, um, or his burial record will show you whether it's Church of England or what denomination the burial took place. And just because your family was Church of England doesn't necessarily mean that they were buried in Church of England. They may have been buried in the congregational section. So don't, you have to actually check the burial record and then start looking through all the pages and the sections of Devonshire Street Burial Ground. Now this is just a volume one of the Church of England. There's 258 pages. So, and there's a few people on each page. So when we're talking about 30,000, 15,000, sorry, headstones, you'll actually get it from Arthur Foster's collection. You can spend hours just going through here. It's like walking through a cemetery, actually, um, and stopping and reading all the headstones. But all that information is available online. at the State Library. Now we actually, we have to thank the wonderful and, and terrific job that both Arthur and um, Josephine Foster did back in 1900. They were foundation members of the Historical, Historical Association of New South Wales because they actually recorded history for us but we also have to appreciate the time and effort that's gone into the digitisation of the Foster Collection at the State Library, but also the indexing of the internment records at the State Archives. These things just don't appear overnight. There is a lot, they're like an iceberg. Now, we only might see the, the top end of it, but there's a lot of underground work that has happened to create these records for us to be able to use, not only in family history research, but also in um, even artwork, the artwork involved. This, um, this photo here is of Hugh MacDonald, who was the first person buried at Devonshire Street Burial Ground on the 9th of September, 1819. And he was aged 36 and he was also a Mason. So there's a lot of information that can be obtained from headstones. There is a Facebook group called Old Sydney Burial Ground and Devonshire Street Cemetery. Now, should you have any family members buried at Devonshire Street, please join us. Uh, there's many researchers in, in there that will, will help you and they'll double check indexes and stuff. There's lots of websites out there that have got, or portals if you wish to call them, that have burial registers and burial lists. I've seen one that has the same lady buried in two different cemeteries and they're about, no, two kilometres apart but because they haven't looked at the records correctly. Always use primary records. This is a primary record. A photo of a headstone is a primary record. 
your newspaper reference, the internment records from the State Archives of New South Wales. They're a primary record. And there's also the transcriptions of all the headstones done by Arthur Foster. So just search Facebook for Old Sydney Burial Ground and Devonshire Street. Some of the websites that have records and images for Devonshire Street Cemetery, Sydney are. We've got all the links to the, all the links to the links, all the links to the appropriate areas within the websites on AustralianHistoryResearch.info. There's also the Australian Jewish Historical Society, which has the De Devonshire Street Cemetery burials and interments. Um, the Bibliography Database of Australia, bdaonline.org.au. It is a subscription site. It's something like 33 or $35 a year, but um, the all the interment records are also there. The burial butts are there and also transcriptions of the um, surviving headstones out at Botany. The New South Wales Birth, Deaths and Marriages, of course. The State Library of New South Wales and the New South Wales State Archives. And let's not forget Trove. Because Trove will take you to the digitised newspapers. The majority of the 1901 articles regarding Devonshire Street and it being removed totally and, take, and all the remains mostly taken out to La Perouse, Botany, whatever name you wish to call it, that most of them have been tagged. Whilst you're in a trove, it costs nothing to become a, um, a user. Please be a registered user and tag the articles that you might see and also do any um, transcription of errors with, with the conversion of text, digital to text. So that's it for Devonshire Street Cemetery for today. I have produced a booklet on Turtle Bay Burial Ground on Norfolk Island. Remember I said burials move under the ground? Nothing, nothing different here either because headstone or remnants of headstones have actually been found in the sand on Emily Bay. It was originally called Turtle Bay and it was renamed in Second Settlement and to Emily Bay. So the history of Turtle Bay, um, many of the deaths up to 1794. So this, you could say, Turtle Bay Burial Ground was actually the second burial ground in the early in early in colonial New South Wales because we already had a burial ground at Sydney Cove. What's the difference between a burial ground and a cemetery? We've been asked. A burial ground is, in the words of Dr. Lisa Murray, a burial ground is simply for the disposal of the dead. It's not row one, plot two, row, row, row two, plot one. They're not necessarily done perfectly in line. When a cemetery is done, um, ha has more structure and format to it. Tomorrow I'm giving a webinar on a burial ground at Ulladulla, which is my hometown, and we have four remaining headstones from 80, and we're going to see explain to you how to look at a location, research the location in regards to knowing why we now only have three headstones from a, from 80 to 96 burials. So that's on tomorrow morning and it will be on Facebook as part of, it will be on Facebook as part of History Week New South Wales and it's on Ulladulla Info Facebook so I will put a link up to that. I hope you've all enjoyed this afternoon. You've learned something and we have to learn to also open our eyes when we when we're doing research because don't presume your haven could be haven. Your Smith could have been spelt differently. You might have always called it Smith. 
but it may have been spelled different on the headstone or the transcription of the name. And yes, um, so enjoy the after the rest of the afternoon. I'll put up the links. The just go to Australian History Research info. The Devon or the Devonshire Street Cemetery resources, interment records, transcriptions of headstones, and also images of headstones, etc. The it has been brought up onto the front page, and it's all there for you to just go there and bookmark the individual links. So, I. Everyone have a good afternoon. S stay safe because where well, most of us are all in lockdown with Devonshire Street Cemetery. Join the Facebook group by all means. Put your um, inquiries up there. And when you're using Facebook, just don't, what has everybody got on Janet Haven? Tell people what you have got. I've got Janet, give them a problem. You know, say, look, I've got Janet Haven. I've seen her tomb at Devonshire Street, show it on the webinar. But she's not in the reinterment records. How can I find more information on her? And they're the sort of questions you should be asking in Facebook groups, not just expecting other people to go and do your research for you in this particular case for family history research. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.